The Janitor Must Die. Read by the author, John Fulton. Chapter 2, Ground Zero. The test chamber buzzed with activity. The circular room was nearly 50 feet across and more than 100 high, the ceiling fading into darkness. The deep shadows were lit only by the blinding pinpoints of spotlights hanging off the ceiling above, half on and half dark. Extra work lights had been brought in, looking oddly fragile on their telescoping mounts. Tangled lines of black power lines snaked across the white painted concrete and steel floor like the web of some massive prehistoric spider. The chamber had changed significantly since its conversion from a Cold War ICBM silo. Empty of its deadly cargo, most of the now extraneous catwalks and gantries had been removed over the past few months, leaving only jagged metal fittings with chipped gray paint. Dr. Stein squinted against the low-mounted lights sending flares across his vision, and he peered into the dark shadows off to his right as he overlooked the test chamber. The many levels ringing the silo itself had been retrofitted to carry hundreds of sensors meant to measure every wavelength of radiation, every photon of light. Everything and anything the specimen emitted during the procedure would be recorded and logged. He stood on one of these balconies now, about a third of the way up the silo, watching as a team of lab-coded scientists and workers made the final preparations to the floor brackets that would hold the specimen in place. A moment later, he saw the foreman in his yellow hazmat suit and gas mask exiting the massive shadowy tunnel to the storage area to his right. His crew and the specimen were nowhere in sight. Stein felt his temper start to rise and headed for the stairs, tucking his clipboard under his arm. He arrived on the chamber floor to find a lively discussion in progress between the foreman and the technicians. Adjusting his hard hat, Stein stalked over to the group. What's going on? He interrupted. Where's your team? The specimen should have been up here a half hour ago. They're working on it, the foreman said. We've got a prob... I'm sorry, interrupted Stein. Were you about to say you have a problem? The foreman was silent for a moment. It makes noise. Stein stared at him, confused. I'm sorry? Your box, the foreman said. It buzzes. It buzzes. Yes, sir, the foreman said. I don't know what kind of rock that thing is, but I think we should have some people check for gas before we move. No, 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 Stein interrupted. Let me make this simple for you. You're late. We're a half hour behind schedule, and my ass is on the line. I don't have time for this. I understand, sir, the foreman said. It's just a safety check. We need to know what this thing is. Frankly, Stein said, you don't. The foreman folded his arms. Then, he said, I'm afraid we'll have to take this over your head. We're breaking several safety protocols as it is. Stein glared at him for a moment, then pulled a sheet of paper from his pocket and handed it to the foreman. The foreman stared at it for a good long moment, looked up at Stein, and then back at the paper. What's this? He said. Signed by Administrator Byrd, said Stein. If you think you can go higher than that, be my guest. Stein stared into the foreman's tinted goggles and tried to look confident. His opponent's expression was as implacable as ever. When he spoke, Stein thought he caught the slightest edge in his voice. Yes, doctor, he said. One humming rock coming right up. Josh! A loud, friendly voice sucked him back to the present with a jolt. He whipped his head around to look behind him. It was a tall man with short, dark hair. He was wearing slate gray fatigues, light gray body armor, and a blinding smile. Hefting a pair of large, black duffel bags, he kicked up his stride a notch, settling in beside Josh. A pair of McKnight security shoulder patches marked each shoulder, a black spade with a white chest knight on it. The name tag on his chest read Foster. Hey, man, Foster said. How's it going? I'm fine, Josh said. I'm just, how are you? Foster squinted at him. You look like hell, he said. You miss breakfast again? No, actually, said Josh, blinking. Hey, do you know a guy named Bishop? Foster looked at the end of the hall and thought for a moment. He shrugged. What does he look like? He's like... Shaven, Josh said, gesturing with a hand over his head. And he wears those old classic sunglasses. They're called, uh... He tried to snap his fingers and squinted. Aviators? Foster said. Yeah, those, Josh said. Have you seen him? Nope, Foster said, shaking his head. Why? Oh, Josh said. Uh, no reason. I just... I met him this morning, and he's kind of... Kind of what? Josh shrugged. I don't know. Maybe I'm just tired. Okay, Foster said. Let me know if something comes up. Oh, by the way, we had another meeting today. Josh hit a scowl. Oh, you did? Yep, Foster quipped. I'm telling you, the boss likes your style. It's only a matter of time before he opens up a slot. And when they do... Foster... Josh sighed. Look, you know I don't blame you. I know, Foster said with a grin. I wouldn't blame me either, because frankly it wasn't my fault. Josh chuckled. But, Foster continued, 
You came all the way out here because I said you could get a security job, and that's what I'm going to get you. Josh pursed his lips and looked at the floor. Okay, he said. Foster put a hand on his arm, and the two came to a stop. Foster's voice softened a bit. Hey, he said. I'm serious. Things are going to get better. I know, Josh nodded. I just... He glanced at the bags on Foster's back. What are those? Foster studied him for a moment, then let out a small grin. Have you got a few minutes? So, Tina said, what happened? In the dim light of the console rack, Nora stuffed the last of her white hairs underneath a maroon headband using her pocket mirror. What do you mean, what happened? She replied, moving on to check the fit of her glasses. She wore a white lab coat over a business-like blue blouse and a skirt with black leggings. She frowned. At first, she thought being able to ditch the skirt and instantly change her appearance or slip into an air vent was rather clever, but now she was beginning to wonder if they looked conspicuously mismatched. Also, the glasses were too narrow, and they had left the real lenses in, giving the world a slight warp that hurt her eyes. She made a mental note to get fake lenses of some kind for the next time, providing there was a next time. Come on, Tina turned away from the console next to Nora, a mischievous grin smeared across her face. How was it? How was what? Nora went over the contents of her shoulder bag once more. A purse might have been more inconspicuous, but she needed the extra space. Pepper spray disguised as a pen, gloves, night vision goggles. You don't want to tell me, Tina teased. It must have been good. Nora gave an exasperated sigh. What are you talking about? Lloyd, Tina said. Come on, how was he? Nora hoped Tina couldn't see her face flush in the dim light. Ah! Tina crowed in triumph. You're pretending you don't know what I'm talking about, but you know what I'm talking about. God, Tina, this is not the time. Nora looked regretfully at the cracked screen of her phone and then pushed a small radio receiver into her ear. Come on, Tina pouted. You guys were in there for like ten minutes. Five, said Nora, and there was no way in hell. I need to focus. What for? Nora turned and gave Tina a hard look. The belt receiver held under her chin as she untucked her blouse. I just told you I need to focus, or have you already forgotten the part where we all might die? Tina shook her head sadly. And now you're going to die a virgin. I'm... Nora cut herself off, stared at Tina, and cut an angry sideways glance at the driver's seat. Screw you, she said. Tina giggled as she turned back to the consoles. Nora took a deep breath, tried to calm her shaking hands, and made sure the idea was secure on her coat as the van slowed and turned off the interstate. They must be approaching the gate. Josh's eyebrows drew together and he gave Foster a look. Foster looked offended. What? It's so... short, Josh said. So? It's gotta be short, or it gets awkward to use real quick, especially in tight spaces. Well, I get that, said Josh. But how's it gonna pick up any muzzle velocity? He pointed to the blunt muzzle of the assault rifle in Foster's hands. Half the powder will burn up outside the muzzle, he continued, not to mention ruin your night vision. Damn, Foster muttered. We have got to get you a girlfriend. The two were standing in a small security office, just inside the heavy blast door that separated the main facility, the grid as it was called, from the more claustrophobic and submarine-like test labs. The office was small, little more than a booth with a glass window, revealing the white ribs of the tubular corridor beyond. Foster tapped the end of the rifle. Yeah, the flash is kind of heavy, but the suppressor cuts most of it. He flipped the boxy weapon over. Besides, it's a bullpup. Barrel goes all the way through it, except for bolt travel. Josh scowled at the boxy polymer sheathed weapon, unconvinced. It looks like someone punched a bunch of holes in a suitcase and then put a gun inside and screwed some rails on the outside to make it look tactical. Foster rolled his eyes. If you want the longer barrel, you can add one. This is what they're issuing, so it's what you've got to learn to use. He offered the weapon to Josh. The janitor looked up at him and raised an eyebrow. Don't worry about it, Foster said. This is the security office. I'm king here. Josh cautiously reached out and took the rifle. It was hefty, but lighter than he'd expected. Its grip solid, but oddly comfortable. Carefully averting the muzzle from Foster as he shouldered it, he pointed it at the floor and looked down the squared holographic sight. Balance is nice, he said. Even with that huge mag hanging back there. It's caseless, Foster said. Half the weight, half the size, and ambidextrous, perfect for lefties like you. Josh's eyebrows went up. Really? Well, almost caseless, Foster admitted. Some kind of plastic or something. The whole system's based around carrying the largest amount of ammo in the smallest package possible, and it ejects down instead of to the side. Oh, okay. 
That's not really what I wanted to show you, though, Foster said, standing up and turning towards the duffel bag sitting in the far corner. This thing, on the other hand, this is going to change everything. I see you've been practicing your movie trailer voice, Josh said, pulling the magazine from the rifle and squinting through the smoke-tinted plastic, Foster snorted. Just put that down and look at this. Josh carefully set the weapon on a nearby office chair and turned to Foster just as the other man finished unfolding what looked like a gray and white full-body brace. His eyes widened. Is that? He trailed off. Whatever you're imagining, Foster grinned. It's better. I don't know, Josh said. I'm imagining quite a bit. It does that too, Foster said. He finished locking the legs and hoisted the stiff frame upright. Wow, Josh said. I'd heard we were working on an exoskeleton, but I didn't know... Is is this like a... This isn't just for, like, carrying cargo stuff around, right? Foster shook his head. Nah, they have those too, but this model is built for combat. You can't throw a truck, but if it's small enough, you can flip it. That's crazy, Josh said. How long does the battery last? Well, that's the real breakthrough, Foster said. The biggest problem was trying to give it enough juice so that it would go as far as a soldier could. Right, I know, said Josh. So how far did they get it to go? Foster folded his arms. If you trade it right, six days, maybe a week on a single charge? Josh gave him a sideways look. You're shitting me. You caught me, Foster said. It's more like six weeks. Josh's eyebrows jumped. They got it up from three hours to six weeks? What's it got? Graphene batteries or something? I don't know, man, Foster said, shaking his head. Technology marches on, am I right? Marching? <laughs> Josh scoffed. More like hitchhiking in a Ferrari. What idiot let you get your hands on one? Live demonstration, Foster replied. Later today. You should come. What time? Uh, kind of up in the air at this point, Foster said. I'll let you know. Dr. Vance exited the main blast door of the facility into the wide main access tunnel and caught a shuttle out. The gates to the tunnel exit weren't nearly as heavy as those to the grid itself, but plenty big on their own and took several seconds to fully open. Realizing his phone probably had reception now, he immediately whipped it out, jabbed the number, and listened nervously, willing the dial tone to connect faster. Come on, come on. Someone picked up. Yes. They blew me off. The experiment's going ahead. There was a pause. I figured, said the voice on the other side. They've got too much invested to back down now. Find Martin, and let me know the second you're online. Yes, sir, Vance said, as a white van passed the shuttle going the other way. Don't worry, we won't miss a thing. Nora scanned a small map of the base in the dim golden glow of the van's overhead lights and reviewed her route. Reaching the control room itself ought to be easy. It was all the way on the far side of the base, through the grid and the missile silo sector, but there were only two checkpoints, one at the main grid entrance and one at the tunnel leading to the test labs, mostly repurposed missile silos. The corner of her mouth crinkled and her eyes narrowed. Easy peasy. As long as her ID passed muster. The guards at the main gate and even the tunnel entrance had accepted Lloyd's, but they hadn't checked hers. Imperfections in the plan were to be expected, but not knowing where they were meant she had to treat everything as if it were a disaster waiting to happen. Trust, she told herself. Mr. E set this up. Mr. E believed we could do it. She took a deep breath and closed her eyes. She wished Lloyd was the one doing this part. He was always better at talking his way into places he wasn't supposed to be. Being able to push people helped. She swept her hair back and snapped it into a hairband, examining the results in her pocket mirror. She scowled. A few white strands had snaked their way out from under the headband and had been pulled into the ponytail. She pulled as many visible strands as she could out and stuffed them under the maroon elastic. She turned her seat around and tapped Tina on the shoulder. Tina half turned away from her monitors. How do I look? Nora said. Like the progressive insurance lady. Nora glared at her. Tina, I've got 30 seconds. Tina squinted at her, wrinkled her nose for a moment, then reached out, twirled her finger around a white hair, and yanked it out. Ow! Nora's eyelids twitched. Tina! You're good, Tina said with a grin. Nora heard static pop in her ear and Lloyd's voice came through. We're coming up on the blast door. Get ready. She snatched up her messenger bag and pushed a tab on her earwig transmitter. Got it. Suddenly, a thought occurred to her. Hey, Lloyd, if you're coming in, who's driving Tina out to the parking lot? Don't worry, Lloyd said. I found Oddball's stash and hid it. What? Nora snapped. Tina groaned. Aw. The van came to a stop and Nora pushed open the back door and stepped out, slamming it shut. The tunnel was wider than she'd expected, almost 50 feet wide, and at least the same to its arching rock ceiling. 
Power conduits and cable scaffolding ran down the apex, obscured by the harsh white glare of the unshielded bowl lights that ran the length of the tunnel. It felt somewhat odd walking into the van in daylight and then exiting it underground. The van's lack of windows was practical, but disorienting. Nora turned right from the back of the van and saw the main entrance, a concrete edifice built into the rock that stretched up to the arch in the ceiling. It was fairly simple, a small guardhouse, a red and white striped vehicle crossbar, and the blast door itself, a gigantic steel square painted white and installed into the wall. She carefully scratched her neck and then pressed the talk button on her earwig. How long until Tina has control of the cameras? Not long, Lloyd said, nudging her elbow. She started. What are you doing? She hissed. Coming with you, he said. Why? Nora glanced down the tunnel. I thought you were going in through... She lowered her voice. The air duct. Nope, he said. I go in through the main door. Then we split up. Nora stared at him. Since when? Since always, Lloyd said. Now let's go. You're making the guards nervous. Nora glared at him for a moment, then shouldered her bag and pasted a warm smile on her face as she approached the guard. She handed over her ID. He glanced at it, then waved her in. Have a nice day, miss. You too, she said as the door slowly swung open. The rough-hewn rock room ahead of her was not much wider than the access tunnel, perhaps a hundred feet, but the ceiling was vaulted to fit the three-story facade of the lab facilities themselves. It wasn't much to look at, just a towering white wall with a garage door in the right and a pedestrian door to the left. The smaller door was graced with steps and a metal awning. See you in five, Lloyd said. Walking ahead, he disappeared through the door. Nora loitered a moment to create distance between them and admired the breathtakingly boring corporate signage. On the blank desert of whiteness, a sign had been painted, the Hunter Corp logo and the message, Welcome to the Diablo Mesa Research Center. Above these, a couple of federal branch department seals were painted in homage to the previous owners. She decided it had been long enough to cast doubt on any connection between her and Lloyd. Stepping onto the porch, she opened the door and entered the structure. Most of the tunnel grid was either office or lab buildings arranged by department. The only exception to this rule was the main storage area, which was its own grid reached by tunnel and the retrofitted missile silos, which until recently had been dormant. According to Mr. E, however, in the last few months, the silo nearest to the grid, Launcher 2, had been completely refitted with sensors for a secret project, a project they intended to derail. That meant that she would be bypassing the aeronautics and propellant labs and heading for the very far side of the grid to the physics department. Taking a quick glance at the signs and comparing them to her map, she made a few turns and headed straight through the line of buildings on the far left side of the grid. There wasn't a lot to see, just narrow white hallways and junctions, lab-coated scientists, workers in green or red coveralls, and the odd security guard in slate and gray. After 15 minutes or so of walking, she found the room she was looking for, an unused closet near a T-junction. She looked both ways and then reached out and grasped the doorknob. Doors were funny things. It was always harder to move something that she couldn't see, the object in this case being the inside knob, but she found it immensely satisfying being able to open a locked door in one swift movement, as if it had never been locked at all. It was strange enough without freaking people out, and she'd often done it as a party trick, explaining it was all in the way you turned it. This door took her a couple of tries to feel out the knob's location, but on the third try it turned smoothly, and she entered, swinging it closed behind her and flicking on the light. Lloyd was sitting in a chair at the far end of the narrow space, with his feet up on a card table set up in the middle of the room. Apparently, this sector's custodial crew enjoyed their Chinese takeout. There were empty oil-stained cardboard cartons all over the table and shelves ringing the room, and everything smelled like sweet and sour chicken. I got the stuff. Took you long enough, Lloyd said, getting to his feet. He began unzipping a large black duffel bag sitting on the floor at his feet. I was starting to get worried. Nora swept the empty takeout cartons onto the floor and dropped her messenger bag with a loud thump. Did you tell Tina I was a virgin? Lloyd stopped digging in the duffel bag and looked up at Nora. Hmm? You heard me, Nora said, laying out the map. She told me while we were in the van. She did, did she? Lloyd pulled out two Glock pistols, a taser, three blocks of C4, and a thermite grenade, stacking them on the table next to the map. Thermite's for you, in case I can't disable the specimen with the explosives, he said. Don't look at it, or you'll burn a hole in your eyes. Nora stared at the stack. Where'd you get the guns? Mr. E had them in here, he said. Nora shook her head. Well, we don't need them. What, are you going to war? We are trying to stop an event that could claim thousands of lives, Lloyd said. If there's anything worth killing for, that's it. Just in math terms. We don't need them, Nora said. We do this clean. Zero body count. You know I won't do anything unnecessary, Lloyd replied. Nora gave him a look. You and I have different definitions of necessary. We have ten minutes. Lloyd said. There's no time to argue about this. 
Nora shot a glance out through the narrow window slats. Okay, she said, and grabbed both pistols. Lloyd looked down at the taser and then back at Nora. She grinned. I call Glocks. Lloyd sighed and pursed his lips. How did you stay a virgin this long? Krav Maga, Nora said. Let's go. Approaching Stein's office, Nora took a quick moment to glance both ways down the hallway. She smiled. There it was. She walked up underneath the security camera in its glass bubble and held her hand palm up, as if she were grasping the camera itself in its socket. After feeling around for a moment, she felt she had a secure grip on the camera and twisted ever so slowly. There was a sharp grinding sound as the electronic motor tried to compensate and failed. The camera was jammed facing a blank wall. Nora walked up to Stein's door, twisted the knob, and entered. The office was a mess, the desk wearing a snow cap of paper punctuated by brown folders and neon manuals. Bookshelves covered two walls and academic accolades the other. She relocked the door and went to work, starting with the desk's right file drawer. It took her several minutes to find what she was looking for, owing to Stein's haphazard filing system, but suddenly she had it. An old, fat manila envelope labeled Project Odyssey. She quickly stuffed it into her shoulder bag and scanned the drawer for anything else interesting. A couple of files caught her eye. She grabbed them, then zipped the bag shut. The foreman's hands were held high as he directed his crew. More! More! Stop! Right there! The monolith settled into place with a soft, ringing thud that reverberated through the entire harness. A series of metal braces had been set up around the hexagonal pillar of black stone, locking it into place on the silo floor. It stood straight up, exactly where its nuclear-tipped predecessor would have resided, despite its smaller size, perhaps four feet wide and thirty high. Composed almost entirely of what appeared to be rough volcanic black stone, the rock was formed into six evenly spaced sides terminating in flat, perpendicular surfaces, as if it had been expertly snapped from a massive pencil lead. Worn, intricate carvings covered its surface, but the object itself looked oddly natural, inorganic, but more in a way that suggested Eon's old geometric crystal rather than skilled workmanship. The foreman and his workers left quickly, some casting strange glances over their shoulders. It only took Lloyd a few seconds to realize why. The low thrum buzzed through the room like the sound of some huge electronic beehive. He stepped cautiously from the shadows. Hey! Lloyd jumped and spun around. Nora entered the janitor's closet, stuffed the shoulder bag into one of the shelves, and exited as fast as she had come, locking the door behind her. Looking both ways, she proceeded down the hall towards the test chamber. She glanced at her watch and swore. There wasn't much time. She pressed her earpiece. Lloyd! Lloyd, are you in position? She glanced up and immediately let her hand fall. A security guard with a pair of coffee cups was talking to a janitor just ahead. The janitor laughed at something and broke off, heading down the hallway to the test labs, while the security guard walked up the hallway towards her. She noticed he was wearing combat fatigues rather than the normal security guard uniform. He was probably part of some sort of response team. He also had two cups of coffee. Nora had missed her morning coffee. She kept her gaze on the floor as he passed by and adjusted her headband for good measure, forcing herself to keep walking at the same easy pace. She heard the guard's footsteps stop. A chill went through her. They began again but did not diminish. He was following her. She forced herself not to look back and went on as before. Getting to the end of the next hallway, she made a quick right, another right, crossed her own path, and then made another couple rights, getting back on track. She took a quick glance behind. No one. In a few moments, she was at the test lab's security gate, just a guardhouse built into the wall, the heavy door itself, and a card reader on the wall next to it. She pulled the card from the lanyard around her neck and swiped it through the reader in one quick stroke. It blinked red at her and beeped angrily. Nora felt an icy pulse shoot through her chest. She swiped again. Beep. Angry red blinking. She was suddenly aware of eyes on the back of her head and turned around a bit faster than she had intended to. There stood the security guard, coffee cups in both hands, staring at her. She opened her mouth to say something and ended up just pointing at the card reader and shrugging. She swallowed hard and looked at his hands. They were full, and therefore he was at a disadvantage. He was a bit taller than average, which meant she was finished if he got close enough to grapple with her, telekinesis or no. At the same time, if he was too far away, he could simply drop the cups and put her down with a pistol on his thigh. He was a tall, sturdy-looking specimen. She might be able to knock him down, or at least knock his weapon away. 
She swallowed a lump in her throat. The corner of the guard's mouth crumpled thoughtfully. Then he calmly stepped up to her and offered her one of the cups. Hold this, please. It took Nora a second to pick up on what he had just said. Hmm? Oh, sure. She took one of the cups from him, watched as he withdrew a key card from his pocket, and swiped it. The reader chirped and turned to happy green. Metal rang on metal as the massive door split in the middle and ground open. The guard gestured to the long, circular, reinforced corridor beyond with his free hand. Ladies first. Nora thanked him, handed back the coffee before he could say anything else, and walked as fast as she thought she could get away with down the circular corridor, keeping her eyes away from the second guard who stepped out of the security booth, a tall woman with pitch-dark skin. The first guard offered the second a cup of coffee as Nora clicked past. She would let out a long breath and felt the tightness in her chest relax slightly. <sighs> Men. Nora approached the control room just as a technician opened the door. As he stepped inside, she briefly caught a glimpse of the high ceiling and huge monitors hanging from the walls. She pushed her earpiece. Lloyd, there's a lot of movement over here. We might not have as much time as we thought. Static. Nora's brow furrowed. Lloyd? She felt that icy hand tightening in her chest again. Reviewing her map, Nora headed for the test chamber. Hurrying down the hall, her clearest thought was, oddly enough, how much she hated high heels. This particular pair had been bought secondhand, and they were a tad small, big enough to justify wearing them for the sake of the disguise, but small enough to make her wish they weren't. The glasses were starting to make her eyes itch. She took them off and soaked tears from her eyes. She heard a cart squeaking up the hallway ahead of her and looked at the floor. She hoped there wasn't a security camera in this hallway. Josh cursed himself for not asking Ruiz which restroom needed to be cleaned. At the time, he'd only wanted the conversation to be over and expected the sick custodian to have noted down which lavatory needed to be taken care of. Unfortunately, he had not, which meant that Josh either needed to clean all six, or he would have to call Ruiz and ask him specifically which one needed attention. Ruiz probably didn't know, which meant he would be irritated and then tell Josh to clean all six anyway. Josh toyed with the idea of giving himself a chemical burn and calling it a day, but that seemed at least as problematic as his other options, with the added discomfort of being mildly dishonest. He sighed and headed towards the front desk, letting his head droop until he was looking at the floor sliding past. Maybe he could bum a coffee off Foster and pump a few endorphins into his brain before starting. He heard the clicking of heels and abruptly realized they were almost on top of him. He jerked his head up and... The bottom of his mind fell out, and he stared open-mouthed at the female scientist in front of him. She cast a passing glance at him, then turned and froze like an animal in the headlights of an oncoming truck. Time crawled and raced. Josh's mind went blank. Nora recovered first. Josh felt the hairs on his arm stand up, as if the air had become charged, and before he could say a thing, she had punched him in the face. He saw stars and galaxies, and then he was out. Nora immediately regretted slugging Josh. Her knuckles had made contact, not just the kinetic bolt, and that meant her wrist now felt exactly as if she'd punched a concrete wall. As he slumped to the ground, she gritted her teeth and quickly glanced up and down the hall. Empty. Shit, she hissed. Nora? It was Tina's voice. Did you just deck that guy? What's wrong? Nora reached up and tapped her earpiece. We're... we're good, she said haltingly. I just need to take care of something real quick. Damn, girl. What'd he ever do to you? Can you get in touch with Lloyd? Nora grunted, dragging Josh into a sitting position. He was substantially heavier than she was expecting. She needed to find a closet, somewhere nearby. Where did he come from? There had to be... I looped the camera so you're fine, but there's people coming down the hallway, so get moving. And go where? Nora snapped, trying unsuccessfully to pull Josh over her shoulder. There's a utility closet around the corner behind you, Tina said. Hurry up, you want to get caught? Nora just growled in response. Come on, she grumbled, glaring at Josh's blank face. You're not even supposed to be here. Administrator Bird folded his arms. He was short, fat, and balding, with hair like cotton balls sticking out every which way. He adjusted his glasses and looked around the test chamber control center, watching the three gargantuan displays built into the wall. Each showed a different angle of the test chamber itself and the specimen contained therein. Half a dozen technicians sat at consoles arranged in front of him, facing the screens. Dr. Stein suddenly entered the door to his right, looking flustered. On seeing the administrator, he instantly cleared the clouds from his expression and smeared a winning smile onto his face. Dr. Bird, he chirped. How unexpected. I'm doing very well, thank you, said the administrator, rubbing a few crumbs from his brown suit. Is something wrong? No, Stein said. In fact, we're ready to proceed as soon as you are. 
Good, said the administrator. Please begin. Stein nodded and approached the technicians. All right, then. Ready to make history? Let's start. Recording active, a technician said, flicking a switch on his console. We're getting a nice, clean feed. Stein sat at a station and tapped the mic in place. Foreman, can you hear me? Just fine, thanks. Stop banging that thing, came the irritated response. Are you ready? Stein said. Silence. Stein directed his attention to one of the monitors, where the foreman could be seen on the silo floor next to the monolith. He was kneeling next to an open plastic case. What's going on? Bird snapped. Stein spoke into the mic. Foreman? The foreman withdrew an oblong shape from the case, a hexagonal rod, almost like a miniature of the monolith itself. Uh, said the foreman, those carvings you talked about, are they supposed to glow? That's none of your concern, Stein said. Please approach the specimen. The foreman did so at a half crouch, as if nearing a cornered beast. One of the technicians squinted at his monitor. Doctor, he said, I'm getting a strong signal. A sharp, sudden quake rattled through the room. Mugs jumped and monitors flickered. Stein reflexively gripped his chair. Dr. Stein, came the foreman's voice. The buzz is getting louder. Much louder. Yes, we can tell, Stein snapped. He swallowed hard and looked at the administrator. Bird just nodded, his eyes on the monitors. Proceed. Stein hesitated for a moment, then went back to his mic. All right, Stein said. Do you see the hole in the surface facing you? Unfortunately, yes, said the foreman. You are going to approach the keyhole, continued Stein, and insert the object at the proper orientation, like we discussed. There was a pause. This is a joke, said the foreman. Right? Bird abruptly pushed Stein aside and spoke into the microphone. Foreman, he said, this is Administrator Bird. You have five seconds to comply. The door behind them burst open and Nora entered, a pistol in each hand. Everybody freeze! Now! Nora waved her weapons at the dozen or so pairs of eyeballs staring back at her and immediately regretted not bringing a mask. She swallowed. Jesus, don't shoot! Stein blurted. The technicians continued staring, hands held high. Nobody moves and nobody gets hurt, she shouted. Everybody stay calm. The door on the opposite side of the room suddenly burst off its hinges in a shower of splinters and two armed figures burst in. Both wore security gray and were loaded down with body armor, helmets, gas masks, weapons, and what looked like a heavy-duty full-body brace. The lead guard raised his carbine, his voice crackling through a speaker on his mask. Freeze! Don't move! Nora saw the second guard's lunge out of the corner of her eyes. The officer leaped over a desk and tackled her at the knees. She felt metal make contact with her legs. One gun went off, the other flew clear of her hand, and she hit the floor hard. In an instant, she felt a knee on her back and a hand on her neck, pushing her into the floor. Someone was screaming over the intercom. Are you seeing this? The foreman shouted. Somebody talk to me! The floor was shaking, the vibration growing louder and stronger. The guard kneeling on her cast a glance towards the monitor bank. The rumble consumed every other sound, pounding against Nora's skull. The lights flickered out, leaving only short snapshots of bright color seared onto the darkness like purple ghosts. Technicians scrambled away from their seats. She heard wind battering against the walls like a hurricane. No, she thought. She screamed it. No! The monitors shorted out to black, shuddered, and then the entire front wall peeled back like dried paint. The black storm shredded the entire front of the room like a cheese grater, circling the bright glow beyond and sucking everything towards it. Nora saw a technician jerked into the air and swept away, screaming, limbs flailing like a rag doll. The monolith was standing, no, floating, on its own, circled by a black windstorm of debris. The carvings on its surface danced and glowed. Violent explosions of sparks popped from the destroyed equipment in front of her. Nora was still staring out into the maelstrom when the guard yanked her upright and muscled her out of the room.